Yeah, I mean, it gets a little bit into the weeds in parts of it, so it might take a while. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Guess we'll see. Like a seed. Okay, I'll just share everything. So we're on uh, chapter seven is matrix analysis. These are the three learning objectives I put for the whole chapter, um, just trying to keep it light. <laughs> so uh, they introduce several vocabulary words to characterize matrices. Uh, most of them were familiar to me, although I don't work in complex analysis. So the fact that they stick to the complex descriptors uh, was a little confusing. Um, and then they go through the two common matrix decomposition, the eigenvalue decomposition and the singular value decomposition. Uh, and then there's some discussion about singular value decomposition and how it's related to dimension reduction and uh, maybe compression. So I tried to uh, form these notes after Andrew's method. So I listed a bunch of things that I thought were new in Julia over the whole, so this is over the whole chapter. Um, so we introduce matrices and talk about how graphs can be considered a form of matrices. And we have this graph, we have some functions um, for graphs, including graph plot, which I looked up is from this graph recipes library. And then there is a method for sum where you can specify the index i if it's when you can get either the in degrees or the out degrees of a graph or an adjacency matrix. Um, they introduce the RGB type for images. I don't think we saw this before. And then um, additionally for images, we have these functions for extracting the red component, green component, blue component, and um, converting to grayscale. And then as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of focus, or I guess they kept the discussion broad um, for the complex uh, numbers. And so we have this, I believe, means uh, one, the, an imaginary number, and then you can extract the imaginary number, imaginary component of a complex number with this function, IMAG. And then we have functions for the decompositions, just getting the eigenvalues with eigenvals, uh, the complete decomposition with eigen, and then the SVD is with SVD. And I won't get into it today, but I think the default that they mentioned was for the thin SVD. So they only give the uh, non-zero eigen, or, I'm gonna say the non-zero singular values. Okay, and then some things. So this argument for plotting, there was an example, this frame is none. So that essentially removed the square around the plot. And then loading data with at load. And I'm guessing this is some Julia data type. This was an example in the book. I did not get it to work but I did succeed in using load in an exercise that I'll show. And then we have heat map plotting and then this reverse function. You can reverse um, the order of an object and you can specify the dimension to reverse. So they use this to flip images by reversing um, the rows. Okay. Okay, so the first section of the chapter is just general discussion about matrices. So they discuss that we can represent tables as matrices where you have essentially right two variables, one in the rows and one in the columns. And then the table is some sort of summary for the uh, like a contingency table or maybe a summary table. Graphs can be represented as matrices where you have a one if the two, so each row and column represents um, the nodes of a graph. So if you have, you have a 
n by n matrix typically, where n is the number of nodes, and then a one represents that those nodes are connected. You can have undirected graphs, meaning the matrix is not symmetric. Wait, sorry. Directed graph is when they're not symmetric, and undirected is when they're symmetric. And then images, also usually represented by matrices or arrays, especially if we have the three channels, RGB. Uh, and then specifically for adjacency matrix A, if you take a power of this matrix, the values, the elements represent how many ways you can essentially walk from node I to node J and K steps. So right, A to the power one just represents that one step connection and then you do induction to get the proof. Okay. So I have that exercise 5.1.5. .5. Um, so this is using a matrix of actor membership in movies. So every row is a movie, and every column is an actor, and so it's not it's not an adjacency matrix, it's just maybe more like tabular data where a one indicates that the actor was in that movie. I guess I didn't put this in the new Julia, but <laughs> download might we might consider a new function. Uh, sorry. Just making sure my, okay. So I download this file at this link. Again, I, I didn't look this up, but I'm guessing some Julia native file. Um, so this is, I'm loading in this data file as the object A. Um, and A is actually a sparse matrix. So yeah, so this must be able to store a Julia object. Um, so A is a sparse matrix. And so the first question is, what is the maximum number of actors appearing in any one movie? We can get this by finding, as I mentioned, um, each column is an actor. So we want to find the row, the movie that has the maximum row sum. So I did quite a bit of troubleshooting <laughs> figuring this out. Um, I tried to use the sum over dimensions that was introduced for the graph, but that method doesn't work on a sparse matrix. So I um, sort of did it manually with this syntax. So the sums over every row. Um, and then I found the max. <laughs> I don't know if there is a, sorry, my AirPods keep like, okay. Uh, Turning on and off the noise cancellation is annoying. Okay, because I'm talking. Uh, so the find max returns the maximum. So the maximum number of actors is 294 and the index is 90,000. I don't think there were any attributes to actually know what movie this was. Um, and that's how I did this. Does anyone know anything about the sparse matrix objects? like? or a array row sum function? No, not really, but uh, I, I noticed that uh, at least in later chapter, in chapter eight, they tried to convert a sparse matrix into a dense one using a matrix command matrix with, with the M capitalized. I don't know if that okay. would work. Turn the matrix, turn the sparse matrix into a dense one, and then do the sum that you that you did in the second line there. I I don't know if that would work. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Anyway, this worked out okay. Um, it was very slow at first. Oh, this is why I put these here, maybe to hopefully initialize. <laughs> but um, there are a lot of movies. I can't remember but it, it was a 
not instant. Um, okay. And then the second part was how many actors appeared in exactly three movies. So this corresponds to the column sums equaling three. So I just took my strategy, but now I have it over the columns. And then I, I didn't, I just assumed like an R that this would, that I could sum up Boolean. So I broadcasted the equivalents um, to three and then added it up. So there's 21,000 actors that were in only three movies. Okay, and there's a lot of refreshing on broadcasting in this chapter, I will say. Okay, and then the last part is define this matrix C, which is A transpose A. And then there's two parts. How many non-zero entries does C have and what is the interpretation of C? So if we think about this, this is an actor by movie matrix and this is a movie by actor matrix so c is an actor by actor matrix and so the non-zero entries correspond to how many movies if it's an off diagonal it's how many movies have those two actors been in together otherwise if it's on the diagonal it's just how many movies that actor has been in um i didn't fact check i just deduced that by my logic so <laughs> if anyone has a contention, let me know. But um, so I calculated A transpose A, define a C. So this is what the sparse matrix looks like. Um, it's similar to what the sparse matrix prints like an R where you have a period everywhere that's zero. Okay. And then um, I wasn't quite sure actually what the not not equal operator is in Julia. So I just, to answer the second part, or sorry, the first part, non-zero entries, I just did greater than zero because I know that every element will either be zero or positive. So there are this many, which is- It's a, it's a little, it's the twilled, tilde operator for future reference. Okay, so if, if I was, <laughs> so what I have tilde, parentheses like on the outside yeah that would work okay uh so this is what 30 million non-zero entries but i was like wow that's a lot but that the demand the number of elements is huge in c <laughs> so uh yeah so this was a lot about uh Matrix manipulation, I guess, broadcasting. Are there any comments on section one? No? Okay. I only have the first two sections. <laughs> uh, so the second section is on eigenvalue decomposition. So I'm sort of assuming that people, that the three of us are from oh, the, with the. Sorry, the, um, it's actually the the exclamation point. The tilde is the bitwise one. It does work in most cases, but I guess it makes a difference. Okay. Bitwise knot is a tilde, and then the uh, regular knot is just bang. Okay. Or exclamation point. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm assuming here that you either at least read the chapter or you're familiar with the definition of an eigenvalue, an eigenvector pair, um, but I included here terms for the complex matrices because this is not the terms that I usually use. So when they say adjoint, they mean transpose, if it's a... So these are the equivalent if it's a real matrix. So the adjoint is transpose, the self adjoint or immersion means the matrix is symmetric, unitary means the matrix is orthogonal. And so again, I am modeling my notes off Andrew's notes. So I tried to write down some of the key theory that they um, discuss. So probably if you ever had an intro 
linear algebra or matrix class, you did eigenvalue decomposition through a root finding problem. Um, so you basically construct a poly polynomial based on the determin determinant and you find the roots and those correspond to the eigenvalues. And then you can solve for the eigenvectors. Um, okay. Uh, matrices, here's another vocab where it's similar. So two matrices are said to be similar if they have the same eigenvalues. Okay, and so, and then if you do a power operation of a matrix, like we introduced for the graph matrix, the operation of power is defined through the eigenvalues. Okay, and then, um, so some of the numeric computation things we need to be aware of is this bauer fike theorem. Okay, so if we perturb our matrix by another matrix, the condition number of the um, the the matrix of eigenvalues is the magnitude of the perturbation of the eigenvalue. I don't know if that makes sense. So essentially, the error in the eigenvalue estimation is a factor of the condition number based on the eigenvector matrix. Okay, and so through this theorem, we introduce the concept of a normal matrix. A normal matrix is a matrix whose eigenvector matrix has a condition number of one. And I had to go back to the earlier chapter about condition number of matrices is remember defined through um, when we solve linear systems and it's the, uh, if we perturb the matrix, how much does that perturb the solution? Okay, and so they introduced this concept of the polynomial root finding problem that you could do analytically for small matrices. Um, and then they go on to say, well, that's not actually how computers compute the decomposition and the way they do it is beyond the scope of the book, but it is related to matrix powers. So um, that's sort of the main discussions from this section. And so I did exercise 5.2.8, okay, to look at this theorem, this perturbation. So we have um, going to look at this, this is the claim that they make in the exercise. Eigenvalues of random matrices and their perturbations can be very interesting. So we're gonna see how interesting and I have some questions about this. So first we're gonna define a random matrix A. Okay, we're gonna get the eigenvalues. Let me zoom in here because these plots are so small. And then we're going to plot the real part of the eigenvalue against the or I guess this is X and Y against the, so the imaginary part against the real part. So that's here. So it's kind of scattered about um, maybe almost in a circle. Okay. And then we're going to perturb A and see and calculate the eigenvalues of the perturb A and then see the effects. So we're gonna create some perturbation here we're gonna perturb our original matrix A by some small random value and plot the, the new eigenvalues on top. This is so small, I wonder if I have it open over here. Oh yeah, right here I do. Okay, so maybe you can see this a little bit better. This is what I got. So I got that for every place that the eigenvalue is, there's a sort of a small noise around it. Um, and then we say, we're going to repeat with the upper triangle of A. 
And this matrix T has all real eigenvalues that have no imaginary parts. Okay, so I just take the upper triangular part of A and I repeat the same process. Okay, these are the origin, the true eigenvalues of T. They're all have imaginary part zero. So they're all real numbers. And then when I perturb, I have a circle. That is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the circle is related to the condition number. So if I look at the condition number, it's, oh, wait, actually, never mind. I misinterpreted this. Um, so that, anyway, I'm going to take that out. But so these are the condition numbers of A and T. A has a much smaller condition number than T. Uh huh. So this spread is much bigger than the spread around these ones. Okay, that makes way more sense. I was missing that E to the 17 when I was going through this earlier, and I was like, this doesn't make sense. So yeah, so um, the relative error is a lot smaller in this one because the condition number is smaller. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you my mistaken interpretation. I'm, I didn't read this and I thought this was just three. I was like, oh, it's a radius three circle around the truth. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what's going on. Why is the upper triangular? I mean, why is the upper triangular part of A so much more sensitive? Um, so much sensitive to perturbation? Or why is the condition number so big? I guess the question. Um, well, if we look here, maybe it's because the separation between the true eigenvalues is a lot smaller. Uh, I mean, mathematically, I don't know why, but intuitively, that's what I would guess. I like, yes. they're that all makes sense. pretty close to each other. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, don't they talk a little bit about how they compute the condition number later in this thing? Yes. Whatever I want to or yeah okay so the, uh that's all the real notes i have but yeah we can look at a couple of um we look at a couple of i always get the thing wrong um, things I wanted to share. Okay, yeah, right here, so. Um, based on diagonalization. Okay, so in diagonalization is the number of unique eigenvalues you have. So a diagonalizable matrix has and unique eigen uh, value. So okay, right here. Since the condition number of a unitary matrix is one. Yeah, I don't know. I just did the exercise. <laughs> I think you're right. It has. I think you're right about the idea. The eigenvalues are close together. It has something to do with it. Yeah. And if because it's a. Uh... Yeah. Um. But if there aren't any questions about those exercises yeah. or the notes, um, I have a couple of things. Okay. I wanted cool. to point out about um the demo. So I was I went through all the demos and was having. Uh, but not difficult, but I, I didn't replicate exactly the plots that they had. Um, and I don't know if they're using another 
back end for plotting, but I was especially curious about this arrow <laughs> argument. So for graph plot, if it's directed, it will plot an arrow. If it's undirected, it won't. And that has nothing to do with the arrow argument. Um, I, what does the arrow argument do? I have no idea. I, have no idea. I well, Is it like a I can tell arrow? you. I can tell you that it doesn't, for me, it didn't do anything because it says the arrow attribute needs a Python plot backend. So uh -huh. I didn't use that, but it controls the aesthetic of the arrows if you use this backend. Okay. So in my Julia terminal, I saw no effect of changing it. Um, I see. And when I looked at the help page for graph plot, it had a link that was broken. So I, I'll put this in the chat. Um, I, and I'll probably put it in. <laughs> I think this is the new link. I guess I shouldn't share everything because this is going to be um... recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so that was interesting. And then all of the stuff about sparse matrix that I was sort of playing around with. I guess it's like nice that they put the, I'm gonna stop sharing now, um, that they put the book package together, uh, but it kind of hides where yeah. all of the, um, the packages that they're using are they do put that on the on the on the place where you get the package there is a list of uh -huh. what they all are and like the alternate way of doing it okay where is my zoom oh where did we go um and then the well, I'll show it next week. The hello world. I also did not get the image to plot this in. I also, for some reason, um, all of my plots were adding a legend for every every time I added to the scatter plot. I was adding a legend like y one, y two, y three. So I at, put legend off, but they didn't have to do that. So that was wow. another weird thing. <laughs> but we saw how to turn legends off before i think andrew talked about it a couple chapters back um, so you when you used arrow it gave you an error or it just didn't do no, anything different? it just didn't make any changes there was I, no I error to, i tried it on the jupiter notebook just now and it also didn't make any changes so i don't know <laughs> how, you, how you activate this python and, plot yeah the back end the other back ends but I'll chalk that up to things to learn about later. There's a lot of things about Julie I don't know, so that's just going to be added, <laughs> added to the list. <laughs> and I'm trying to get trying to learn it uh, as I go here, and also using that book, uh, Julie as a second language. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I just do so much stuff in Python during the day, so it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> my brain just has trouble switching gears. But I'm trying to learn that SciML stuff, so I may have to mm -hmm. get better at it. I have, I have an application for it. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to play around with it very soon now. <laughs> there are some broken links on that documentation too, though, unfortunately. Okay. Which can be frustrating for... So I hope you're not too disappointed. I only have 30 minutes, so I'll finish up uh, next week with the singular value decomposition. Um, yeah. So, right, so single value decomposition, I guess the other parts, the symmetry. Yeah, there's three sections. Maybe we can basically. go through relatively quickly. Yeah, I'll do some more. I try to do the like hardest exercises. <laughs> yeah. Um, and dimension reduction, I guess that's just a demo or anything else. So, yeah, they, they bring back the, um, concept of the thinned 
Yeah. Matrix. Um, yeah, I think overall this chapter is a lot of, like I said, for me, a lot of bookkeeping with the jargon about complex matrices. Yeah. Otherwise. <laughs> No, for me, it's all pretty much review because I always use complex matrices. So, mm. and quantum yeah. mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> the only, the actually only tricky for me to think of me is that using an asterisk for adjoint it just throws me off because I'm so used to in physics we use like the uh, little cross, the dagger. Oh. And a star yeah. means complex conjugate. So every time I take a star, I remember okay, that's adjoint. Remember. Mm. So do you know why? Uh. They said adjoint is her mission and self adjoint is also her mission. Is one like a verb and one? I've never heard. Ad I've never heard adjoint being called her mission. The her mission. Maybe it's a typo. I've never heard that. No, maybe it's, it's something that people use, but I just have never heard that. I only heard it called the adjoint, or that's it. I and mean, a matrix that is self adjoint is her mission, but I've never heard it called that. Hmm. Maybe I mean I'm just googling it now. It's one of the common thing. I'm going to say, and now I'm 